Colin Thackend was a man of peculiar principles. His guiding philosophy in life could be summed up in one word, scatter. Colin firmly believed that he was not meant to own anything, but rather to make use of whatever objects and possessions temporarily came into his orbit before passing them along to someone else who might put them to better use. It all started one crisp autumn morning when Colin awoke with a sudden epiphany. Gazing around at the accumulated detritus of his 35 years, the moth-eaten sweaters, the dog-eared paperbacks, the chipped coffee mugs emblazoned with inscrutable corporate logos, he was struck by the utter pointlessness of it all. Why was he hanging on to these things? Out of sentiment, laziness, some misguided sense that he might need them someday? No, Colin decided, it was time to set himself free. And so began the great purge of Colin Thakand. He started small, gifting a well-worn flannel shirt to the homeless man who always sat outside his local coffee shop. The feeling of lightness that suffused him as he walked away from that initial act of scattering was intoxicating. Soon, Colin was finding creative ways to rehome all his worldly possessions. The stack of back issues of The Economist went to his bemused elderly neighbor, who accepted them with a wrinkled brow and a polite nod. His prized vinyl collection was foisted upon a thrilled teenage barista. The mountain bike he'd ridden twice was passed along to his second cousin, who greeted the gift with a skeptical, you sure about this, Coles? But Colin had never been more sure of anything. Each belonging that left his hand seemed to lift an invisible weight from his shoulders. Unencumbered by material things, he felt fleet and untethered, ready to float through the world as a self-appointed nomadic philanthropist, distributing the detritus of capitalism to all the have-nots and have-a-littles. His minimalist crusade did not go unnoticed. Friends and family began to express concern as Colin's apartment grew increasingly bare. His sister staged an intervention after he tried to give away their great-grandmother's heirloom candlesticks to a passing nun. His best friend gently suggested that maybe Colin was working through some things and ought to talk to someone. But Colin just smiled serenely and quoted Lao Tzu, He who knows he has enough is rich. Admittedly, Colin's new lifestyle posed some challenges. It's hard to cook a meal when you've given away all your pots and pans. Sleeping on the floor loses its appeal after the third night of waking up with a stiff neck. And try as he might, Colin couldn't quite bring himself to part with his trusty laptop and smartphone. How else would he keep up with the latest TED Talks on minimalism and send his friends Onion articles about the pitfalls of consumerism? Even a radical ascetic needs a tether to the modern world, Colin reasoned. For the most part, though, he reveled in his newfound freedom. No longer bogged down by belongings, Colin could pick up and go wherever the wind carried him. He crashed on couches, lived off the largesse of amused acquaintances, and regaled everyone in his orbit with wide-eyed lectures on the life-changing magic of giving stuff away. But Colin's carefree lifestyle was fated to be short-lived. One morning, two years into his experiment in extreme altruism, he woke up and realized that he had nothing left to give. His apartment was empty, save for a bare mattress and his few non-negotiable essentials. His contacts, once charmed by his quixotic quest, had grown weary of his mooching and begun to avoid his calls. Even the homeless man outside the coffee shop just shook his head and waved Colin away when he tried to offer him the shirt off his back. Faced with the limits of his own philosophy, Colin felt unmoored. If he was not the guy who gave everything away, then who was he? Had his grand experiment been nothing more than a prolonged exercise in self-indulgence masquerading as selflessness? Heavy with existential uncertainty, Colin wandered the streets searching for something he couldn't quite define. It was then, in his darkest hour, that Colin stumbled upon a yard sale tables heaped with cast-off treasures stretched out before him like an oasis in the desert. Scarcely aware of what he was doing, Colin began to fill his arms with trivia and tchotchkes. A wood-handled jump rope, a paint-by-numbers portrait of a soulful basset hound, a commemorative Charles and Diana tea tin. 
As he handed a few crumpled bills to the elderly woman manning the cash box, Colin felt a long-forgotten sensation wash over him. The simple, primal joy of acquisition, of surrounding himself with stuff for no reason other than that he wanted it. Was this what he'd been missing all along? The ballast of belongings, the satisfying weight of ownership. With an armload of rescued junk and a head full of questions, Colin walked slowly back to his barren apartment. He arranged his new possessions lovingly on the bare shelves, then stepped back to survey the recluttered landscape of his life. It wasn't much, but it was a start. As he lay down on his lumpy mattress that night, Colin's mind whirred with possibilities. Maybe there was a middle ground between pathological ownership and radical renunciation. Maybe the key was not so much scattering as it was mindful curation, conscious consumption. Or maybe he'd just swing wildly between extremes for the rest of his life, a perpetual searcher toggling between too much and not enough. Only one thing was certain, Colin thought as he drifted off to sleep. He'd never look at a yard sale the same way again.